a plate of heartbreak with a side of tears and a tall cup of wholesome to wash it all down. That's what I'm having for Christmas because that's what Oda has served us with this beauty of a chapter to finish off Kuma's flashback. Seriously, for anyone who reads the official Viz translation is in for a sad Christmas day because Oda has hand wrapped a big present that will leave you flawed, crying at 7am with a firm belief that Kuma was the last pure thing in this world and now he's been taken from us because this my friends is Kuma's life and oh what a life it was. Just as many of us have been expecting, Oda finished 2023 by wrapping up Kuma's flashback and this one is for the books. Quite possibly one of the best, most emotional, most tragic backstories in One Piece. It will truly have a place in the great backstory hall of fame and if you agree that Kuma's backstory was peak storytelling then subscribe because that's what Kuma would have done. Just as I think that Oda's writing can't get any better, he proves me wrong, displaying that his talents are boundless. Because what was that ingenious sequence of panels? You know which one I'm talking about, that sequence that recounts Kuma's life by glimpses of the lives that Kuma has touched with his. Oda executed this beautifully because although technically this is Vegapunk witnessing, or in Vegapunk's own words, taking peeks at Kuma's life, it also has the effect that this is Kuma remembering those he loved the most in his last moments. That idea of your life flashing before your eyes before you die. And brilliantly interspersed through it all was that montage of Kuma running. The tireless journey that he's been forced to endure. The journey that has been his life. One filled with people he loved. Those that kept him running. Made his life meaningful. Made that exhausting marathon worth it in the end. And these people that meant so much to him, they equally loved him back. Reading those panels, I couldn't help but think of the iconic quote, when is a man truly dead? And I'm sure that Kuma will never die. And in my opinion, this sequence also meant so much more than that. Oda packs in a whole lot of meaning and emotions just simply by the way in which he draws Kuma in each of those panels. We see that from early on, Kuma's life has been difficult. For no fault of his own, just the sheer fact that he was born a buccaneer. Kuma's first words were loss and heartbreak. We see Kuma struggling from a young age. His blood, sweat and tears demonstrating that Kuma ran out of desperation and for his life. Not in that same joyful way that children run when they know no fear or no bounds, free to run because they can. Kuma ran because he had to. His life depended on it. But because of the people that he met along the way, he kept going. His desperation turning into determination a sense of meaning for his life. But then he almost gave up when he lost Ginny. We witness him stumble, almost lose his way, only to recover out of his love for his daughter. Bonnie keeps him steady. That much is clear from his very posture. Kumar isn't trudging along, he's upright and determined. And yet it's also clear that he is very much still exhausted. Which is why when Vegapunk delivers that good news that Bonnie can be cured, Kuma can finally relax. That last panel in the sequence, it shows a man making a sprint for the finish line. The end goal finally in sight. Kuma can go in peace, knowing that his daughter is safe and he can finally relax. It's just such a subtle way of storytelling, a superb use of symbolic metaphor that I appreciate so so much. And it makes me emotional even just discussing it with you guys. In those last moments, I just want to pluck Kuma out of the page, give him a big bear hug and say, it's all over now. You can rest. You've done such a good job. You were a hero. And what another brilliant use of that sequence to imply that very message. Kuma almost being drawn like Nika. But whereas Nika is the emblem, the god of freedom and joy and laughter, Kuma is the man who came before. The one who toiled and struggled. Kuma ran so that Nika could dance. And because Kuma is very heavily laden with biblical and religious imagery, and One Piece itself has a lot of religious symbols, the way that Oda drew the light shining through on Kuma's final moments, the panels of Sentomaru and the whole science crew praying at his death, the contrast between the light shining in the background while Vegapunk did the devil's work of shutting down Kuma's consciousness, effectively bringing an end to his life, Vegapunk and the machine itself colored in black, while 
light all around him. For me, it really left this sense of Kuma being called up to heaven, as if the light was shining down to guide him up above, as if Kuma was a prophet and the gods called him home so that he could take his place next to them, watching and witnessing the future of the world unfold from above. Kuma's done his role fulfilled his purpose. Now it's up to those left behind. In Kuma's own words, his legacy. And boy, what a legacy that is. Which again has me thinking, man, I wish Bonnie joins the Straw Hats, even if it is for just a little while. And I do love that callback because we see Kuma tell Vegapunk about his hopes and dreams of having contributed to the birth or the success of a hero in Luffy and the legacy that he will leave behind with Luffy and Bonnie. To then later on in the chapter, Vegapunk assuring Kuma that he too was a hero. And he truly, truly was. Something else that really hit hard for me this chapter was seeing all past events from Kuma's point of view. Over the last however many chapters we've seen more and more of Kuma's life unfold, we've been feeling in the pieces about, ah, so that's why Kuma acted this way at Sabori. Or this is what he must have been thinking at Thriller Bark. So to see those events actually unfold from his perspective in this chapter wasn't completely new or eye-opening, but it still delivered so many feels. There's something about Kuma's sweet face and his pure heart that actually experiencing for ourselves exactly what he was feeling in those moments hit so much more than I imagined it would. I was squealing at the cuteness and yet the tragedy of him keeping an eye on Bonnie from afar, his giant head peeping through the window, tearing himself away from his daughter before she could see so as not to place her in any danger. Danger. Which I want to say, maybe Gyogo noticed, but if he did, he doesn't seem to have ever mentioned it to Bonnie, so maybe he didn't. I felt the pride that Kuma did at witnessing Luffy's reliable and loyal group of Nakama. I felt hurt on his behalf that he had to bear the burden of being the villain when tearing the straw hats apart, them not yet understanding his actions, not recognizing his intentions for what they were. Because it also ties back to his later comment to Vegapunk when he wondered how much pain or trouble he brought to others. Because yes, Luffy and the Straw Hats felt pain back then, but it was a necessary pain that Kuma inflicted. And I wonder whether Bonnie will share her father's memory with them for the crew to also appreciate that. I think another reason I love these scenes so, so much is also because it's another testament to Oda's great writing. Seeing those scenes unfold, I experienced the same emotions that I did when I first encountered those moments. It brought back memories of how hype I felt when the Straw Hats came in to protect Luffy, admiration and respect at Zoro's nothing happened, the satisfaction of seeing Charlos get his comeuppance, all of those iconic scenes. But at the same time, I also got to experience it with a new lens. I got to feel those emotions through Kuma's eyes and the appreciation that Kuma felt in witnessing what makes Luffy and the Straw Hats different, what makes them the new dawn. I know one of the questions after chapter 1100 and 21 was that if Kuma knew Nika had a body and powers that made him rubbery, then he must have known Luffy was Nika. But I really like the way that Oda has explained this in this chapter. Kuma wasn't sure, but suspected or rather hoped that Luffy may be the savior. And not just because of the boy's powers, but it was Luffy's actions that convinced him. It seems very much like when he first witnessed Luffy, he was simply interested in him as Dragon Sun, wanting to help his comrade understanding the pain that his friend also felt being separated from his child. But as he witnessed Luffy grow and grow and continue to leave an impact on the world, Kuma felt this growing suspicion that this boy isn't just another boy. This one's special. It's not a huge difference, but I think it makes more sense and means more in terms of Kuma's story. Again, going back to his religious theme, Kuma didn't decide to help and protect the Straw Hats out of an overwhelming sense of certainty that he was assisting his idol, the legend, the god. He did so out of hope and faith, which is what religion is all about. Something else that piqued my interest was Kuma reflecting that the Straw Hats are the first to attack a celestial dragon in hundreds of years. And now this may just
just be a throwaway line. But the mad speculator in me can't help but wonder if he's talking about specific instances. Was it the giant robot incident, for example? What does Kuma know? How does he know it? Was it lore that he uncovered during his time as a revolutionary? How much more do the rest of the revolutionaries know? And so on and so forth. This chapter also gave us an explanation or glimpse into Bonnie's journey since escaping the clutches of the world government. And I love the classic misunderstanding that has brought her her infamy and status as a supernova. I love the idea that Bonnie, like Luffy, hasn't been committing heinous, typical evil deeds of a pirate, but has actually been fighting the bad guys. But she's been misunderstood to be attacking seniors and vulnerable babies, which is what has given her her bad rep. It explains her first meeting with Zoro so much, the fact that she risked her own life to save his, because that's also the type of person Bonnie is. It's the type of person that Kuma raised. And this similar worldview or values that she shares with Luffy, again, come on, perfect straw hat material. And I may be being too hopeful here, but surely Oda didn't just add in that interaction between Vegapunk and Saturn and seed those ideas of a personality switch that will allow Kuma to retain some of his individuality just to emphasize what a dick Saturn is. Dick. Not to say that I didn't love seeing Vegapunk stand up to Saturn like that once again, but that's the thing. We've seen Vegapunk openly defy or talk back to Saturn on a number of occasions now. So I think he certainly has the guts to go behind Saturn's back and go through with his original plan. Sure, Saturn might blow up his chest and threaten Vegapunk that he's also a scientist. You can't pull one under me. But there's a reason why Vegapunk is considered the world genius. One of a kind. He's smart enough to pull one over the Gorosei. Besides, why else or how else would Kuma be acting the way that he is now? In a manner that even top officers like Sakazuki can't understand. Well, I guess we're gonna find out soon because Kuma's flashback is over. And chances are, the next time we see him, he'll be arriving at Egghead to ensure the safety of his legacies once more. And maybe that'll be as soon as the very next chapter? Well, I guess we're just gonna have to wait and see. But on that note, let me know what you think by leaving a comment below and seeing as this chapter seems to be the last official chapter of the year. What was your favorite moment of 2023? Again, let me know by leaving a comment below. And I know we're on a break, but don't worry because I have plenty of videos coming up to get you through the break. And for real this time, because I'm on break from work for a couple of weeks. And if you would like more consistent One Piece discussions, please do subscribe, like, and share the video. It means a lot and goes a long way. If you're feeling extra generous, you can join the lovely executive officers by becoming a channel or Patreon member yourself and I do thank all of our executive officers for your continued support and a massive thank you to all of you for watching this video. This is Joy Girl and I'll see you again soon.